quiet Canadian village called Gaspé. Here, in the first summer of the life of England's first Elizabeth, the French navigator Jacques Cartier raised a cross near the mouth of an unknown, unnamed river. He went back to France thinking he had discovered a passage to the Orient, and a year later he returned to the river on the day of the Feast of St. Lawrence, and the river took that name. Now, more than four centuries later, the second Elizabeth, Queen of Canada, begins a voyage which marks the fulfillment of a dream that has run as deeply through Canada's history as the River St. Lawrence itself. The dream of the St. Lawrence as a road to the riches of a vast new continent. Her Majesty's yacht Britannia sails into the river's wide gulf, an expanse of water so great that Cartier took it to be a newfound ocean. Escorting the great blue yacht are ships of the Royal Canadian Navy and the Royal Navy. Most of the world's great rivers grow gradually from a hundred streams, but the St. Lawrence springs full flood from the Great Lakes, flowing from Minnesota 2,500 miles to Belle Isle at the Atlantic portal, sliding and plunging three times the height of Niagara in its course to tidewater. When this was New France, the river was the artery that gave life and sustained it. The settlers called it Le Chemin du Bon Dieu, the Road of God. The Saguenay River pierces the forbidding north shore of the Lower St. Lawrence opening a country rich in pulpwood, minerals, and power. Beneath ancient rock ramparts, Britannia's whistle awakes the Saguenay's famous echoes. One hundred and twenty miles upstream from the Saguenay is Quebec, a city of the sea where the Atlantic tides are still strong, and a city of the river 
sentinel of the river ever since Champlain brought the first 27 settlers to found the old town beneath Cape Diamond. Redcoats and Highlanders scaled the heights on a moonless, misty September night in 1759. The Britannia's royal passengers are met by the premier of the province and other officials of the ancient capital. While redcoats of the renowned Royal Van Deuxième, the garrison regiment of the Citadel, form the guard of honor. I never saw anything more superb than the position of this town, wrote Le Comte de Frontenac in 1672. But the Quebec of narrow streets, old city walls, and memorials of brave days is in a way deceptive. For while Quebec remembers the past, the whole province has confidently seized the future. Fifty years ago, forests and farms produced most of Quebec's wealth. Today, though Quebec leads the world in pulpwood production, most of its wealth comes from the industrialization which has transformed the province. In 1684, Le Baron de Laontin sailed from Quebec to Montreal. Both sides of the river, he wrote, are so very closely inhabited that one can truthfully say they are two continuous villages 60 leagues in length. The seigneuries gave their names to the towns of the river today. Farm and dairy towns, shipbuilding and steel towns, titanium and nylon towns, Lotbinière, Sorel, Contrecoeur, Verchère. Verchère, where the 14-year-old Madeleine and her small band defended the seigneury for eight days and nights against a war party of 50 Iroquois. was as far as early ships could go on the broad and level Chemin du Bon Dieu. And because of this, Montreal became the natural meeting place for the fur-laden canoes from the west and the trading ships of Europe. Today, Montreal, still a meeting place, has 10 miles of docks to handle ships bearing flags and cargoes of the world. <laughs> This has been the gateway to their new land for millions of Canadians. And where the Britannia docks, hundreds of immigrant ships have birthed with new subjects for the Queen. When Sœur de Maisonneuve founded Montreal in 1642, mass was celebrated, and the priest said, Look, gentlemen, what you see is only a grain of mustard seed. 
I have no doubt that from this seed will grow a great tree that will one day achieve wonders and be multiplied and spread to all parts. The furs of the voyageurs gave way to timber for the fleets of Britain. Timber gave way to steel and rails, cotton and plastics, rubber and pharmaceuticals, sugar and beer and aircraft. Montreal became a city of two million people, where the two main languages blend with a dozen others as the citizens greet their queen. Montreal, the waters of the St. Lawrence are torn by rapids, and for centuries, travelers have struggled to pass them in canoes and then in small ships through small canals. The latest conquest of those rapids will take the Britannia beneath the bridge named after Jacques Cartier to travel a route that has opened the Great Lakes for most of the world's deep sea ships. The Britannia, 25 times as large as Cartier's three ships combined. At a ceremonial area in St. Lambert, beside the new seaway, are citizens of the two nations who join their wealth and their work. The work of more than 59,000 men and women, whose names have been recorded for the heads of state of their two countries. Dwight D. Eisenhower, President of the United States of America, and Elizabeth II, Queen of Canada. company has come together from the two great countries that border this waterway to mark the completion of a combined operation that ranks as one of the outstanding engineering accomplishments of modern times. We can say in truth that this occasion deserves a place in history. It is above all a magnificent symbol to the entire world of the ach achievements possible to democratic nations peacefully working together for the common good. Now the Britannia has taken aboard the royal and presidential parties and the Prime Minister of Canada has joined them and the ship knifes swiftly towards a ceremonial gate to officially open the seaway.
Several of the St. Lawrence's bridges had to be rebuilt to accommodate the tall ocean ships. One was the Victoria Bridge, the first bridge to span the river, opened 99 years earlier by Elizabeth's great-grandfather, and as important in its time as the seaway. For the Victoria Bridge, too, was a final link in a 2,000-mile railway between the Great Lakes and the Atlantic Ocean. The St. Lambert Lock lifts the Britannia 15 feet into the La Prairie Basin Channel. Nine miles of sailing then to the Cote St. Catherine Lock, where there will be another step up in her progress towards the lakes. Though canal building near Montreal had been tried as early as 1680, the first waterway to bypass the feared Lachine Rapids was not completed until 1825. It was five feet deep. This canal was later deepened and rebuilt several times. Using this old channel, a ship would take four and a half hours to pass the five locks between Montreal and Lake St. Louis. In the new Seaway Channel, with just two locks, a ship takes only three hours for the journey. In the Cote St. Catherine Lock, the Britannia is lifted 31 feet and sails out past welcoming Cognawaga Indians, Mohawks who were early allies of the French and later of the British. This is Lake St. Louis, named after a young companion of Champlain, drowned in the rapids now left behind. The Royal Yacht is welcomed by hundreds of gay pleasure craft and Canadian and United States warships in stately review order. At the head of Lake St. Louis is another set of rapids. The Cascades, Split Rock, Cedar, and Coteau. Here the royal travelers get the first sight of the dual purpose of the seaway. For it is a power project as well as a ship channel. When the mighty Boharnwa power development was built 30 years ago, it was designed to be incorporated into a future seaway. Beside the power dam, the new Bohanwa locks lift the Britannia 84 feet to the canal, which also serves Boharnois turbines. At Boharnois, it is time for friends to say goodbye. The President of the United States and the Prime Minister of Canada and their wives leave for home.
Until now, both shores of the seaway have been Canadian, and the channels, bridges and locks were built by Canada. But as the Britannia sails into Lake St. Francis, she approaches the international border. To the south is United States territory, to the north, Canadian. And the long Sioux Rapids at the head of the lake belonged to both countries. Belonged because they no longer exist. Their power was needed for the homes and factories of the province of Ontario and the state of New York. To harness the power of the Long Sioux required the closing of the south channel of the St. Lawrence and the building of a complex of dams to regulate the flow of water and generate power. The power dam, since it crossed the international border, was built half by the United States and half by Canada. One generating plant taking the name of an American Power Authority chairman, the other of a Canadian. From the 32 generators of the power dam, 16 for each country, comes enough electricity to supply all the needs of four cities the size of Toronto. The need for this power was an important factor in the decision to go ahead with the seaway, for the projects are closely linked. Now the Britannia moves forward again, leaving the Eisenhower lock to sail out into man-made Lake St. Lawrence. And on shore, another ceremony for the Queen. On United States soil, for the first time in her voyage, the Queen is met by the Vice President of the United States, the Governor of the State of New York, and the Premier of Ontario. <laughs> Among the thousands of both nations who have come to greet the Queen, are people from the 500 farms and half dozen villages that were submerged when the river was dammed and the new Lake St. Lawrence was created. On the banks of the new lake, new towns have been built for them. Long Sioux, Ingleside, and a new Iroquois. In the center of the power dam, on the international border itself, the Queen unveils a monument. It carries these words. This stone bears witness to the common purpose of two nations, whose frontiers are the frontiers of friendship, whose ways are the ways of freedom, whose works are the works of peace. The Britannia, a ship from the ocean, is climbing towards the Great Lakes. But it isn't only the opening of the Great Lakes to seagoing ships that makes the seaway so significant. Equally important is the new freedom the seaway will give to the Lakers, those long, capacious ships which, until now, have been imprisoned by the old, small canals below Lake Ontario. Their cargoes had to be reloaded into small canalers for the trip through those canals. Now, whether they are carrying grain for the deep sea ships in Montreal or iron ore from Labrador to the Great Lakes, loading and unloading into smaller ships may be eliminated.
under the Ivy Lee Bridge, through the sparkling net of the Thousand Islands, beyond the last of the rapids, the Britannia sails, herald of a new age of shipping. Bigger ships than ever before, five times as big, more goods than ever before, five times as much will follow her. And the passage will be 12 hours faster than through the old canal system. More than a hundred years ago, there was a plea. Our burdens can be removed and our prosperity ensured only by constructing a ship canal, thus rendering the shore of the lakes a sea coast. On now the Queen goes past the new seaports of that sea coast. Toronto, Hamilton, Rochester, Buffalo, Toledo, Windsor, Detroit, Sarnia, Milwaukee, Chicago. This is the core of the greatest industrial concentration in the world, where 60% of Canadians and 40% of Americans work and live. Beyond the industrial heart is the goal of the voyage, the head of the lakes. And the Britannia is 2,500 miles from the Atlantic, at the portal of another empire, the West. The old West of grain and cattle, and the new West of oil and metals. The Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence River are one, and they have become a sea coast.